Hello and welcome back to Tech Days Online 2017. One of the problems I see in data science, one of my favorite things, is we've got academia over there, there, and over there, we've got the real world. Well, actually, at the moment, we've got academia over here, and we've got the real world over there. So I'm joined by Dr. Bradley Love from University College London, and a whole load of other places, including uh, Texas and Boston. And yeah, I've been around, but I'm, I'm happy to be here, in particular at, at Microsoft today. Yeah, I'm a professor of cognitive and decision uh, sciences at UCL, and a faculty fellow at the Alan Turing Institute for Data Science. Um, my research involves aspects of experimental psychology, uh, neuroscience, and machine learning. And for purposes of today, we're focusing on social sciences. So I want to talk a little bit about um, how we could use theory from social sciences uh, to inform big data analyses. Yeah. Yeah. So trying to understand what us humans are up to using big computing and smart people. Yeah, exa exactly. And trying to get more out of uh, the data by incorporating some constraints, some more theory from uh, behavioral sciences to um, make the solutions we come up with a little bit more understandable, you know, open up the black box, so to speak. You're not going to frighten yeah. us with too many equations, are you? Oh, I promise there are no, uh, oh, there's one equation, but okay. it's very simple. Yeah, so no, <laughs> no need to tune out just yet. Because <laughs> <laughs> I think Stephen Hawking said the number of equations would cut his book sales in half every time he put an uh, equation in. So, so. Well, he knows how to move the book, so I should take that advice. <laughs> <laughs> Right, anyway, sorry. To oh, no, no, no. Uh, yeah, so I was thinking I was trying to cover um, two topics. So one concerns um, uh, basically predicting when people are willing to explore new options. So if someone buys a Coke every day at lunch, can we predict when they want to open to trying something new? And it turns out, you know, we, we can. The second part, um, I want to talk a little bit about why people perceive certain products to be similar to each other. Like, why is a Coke more like a Pepsi than a bottle of water? And it turns out, Using techniques from computational linguistics, we could pull out uh, these sort of similarities that people find just looking at, you know, the purchase patterns. So, yeah, I want to focus on that stuff. I know this is tech days, um, but a lot of this talk will be, be science focused. But along the way, I'll try to uh, convey some practical lessons, some problems we came across um, in these projects that might help out uh, those listening on their own projects and try to keep it in a fairly um, general way. So the first part of the talk involves sequential data, time series, and there I want to talk about um, how interpretation can go awry and the importance of doing permutation tests, which there won't be equations, but I'll, I'll, I'll just give the basic concepts so people could chase up that are interested in that. In the second part of the talk, I'll talk about some of the dangers of just applying uh, a package you know, from some popular machine learning library and how you, just some checks you want to do to make sure your solution actually makes sense. Yeah. Okay, right, well, let's do this. All right, great. Okay, so um, in the last 10 years, you know, there's been an amazing pro progress in uh, machine learning research, and a lot of it actually has been taking these more black box approaches that I'm going to contrast with uh, what I'm going to be up to today. So, for example, um, maybe you've come across uh, these um, deep convolution neural networks that are the state of the art in um, object recognition. And these, these models are the ultimate black box. They contain uh, millions of parameters or weights. Um, and uh, they work very well, but it's not always clear why. They're trained, all these weights are trained on, um, on just tons of labeled images. Mm -hmm. So if you feed these models uh, images of cars, people, and they're labeled, and then they'll actually generalize to novel ones, which is great, but it's not always clear why. And let me show you an example. So I don't know. Um, Andrew, if you could tell me what, what this is, this um, object. I think it's a way of sending our audience to sleep. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, uh, it looks like we've gone, uh, I think we did send somebody to sleep. <laughs> yeah, we've sent, we've sent the machine to sleep. OK, um, well, anyway, uh, I think the, so that image uh, yeah. uh, to us so, looks like uh, a penguin. <laughs> is it? Yeah, nothing. Well, yeah, I mean, I think you're, you're seeing the, the next slide. I am. I'm cheating. I'm sorry. No, it's OK. But uh, it, this looks like much of nothing. But yeah. to the, the, the deep convolution network, this is the 100% confidence example of, of a penguin. OK. Well, and I can kind of see what's <laughs> going on here. Yellow bands and those, those yeah. stripes going down are almost the same profile yeah. as a penguin. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Like there's some key like texture elements or color you know, features yeah. that it's picking up on. So it's clearly not seeing the images like we are, you know, yeah. and, and this could lead to the spoofing, you know, so there's some practical, mm. um, so this is an actor, Amila Yovich, uh, yeah. but according to the state of the art um, 
yeah. image rec uh, face recognition system. This is also her, and it doesn't uh, really yeah. look very much like her to me. Uh, mm. So there again, there's just key, some key texture elements that the model's using, and uh -huh. those are basically been pasted onto this fellow's uh, spectacles, and so that's so enough that, to spoof the system. So if I take these yeah. off, I'm going to look more like you or less like you? Uh, uh, Mila? <laughs> 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 yeah. <laughs> Luckily, I'm, yeah, I'm running um, uh, human hardware software. But uh, I guess the point, so that you could imagine some uh, real-world yeah. consequences to not understanding um, how, your, yeah. how your machine systems, learning systems are working. Um, so what I want to advocate here today is, um, you know, we're never going to get rid of the black box approaches, but it would be nice if in cases we could adopt a, a simpler model and take a more of a theory-driven approach So today topics in social science. So when I talk about taking theories from experimental to psychology and decision making and how people detect similarities mm -hmm. and uh, use them really as a lens to guide um, the yeah. analysis process, yeah, rather than having millions of tunable uh, parameters and see if we can get some results. So we want to open up the black box and hopefully what's inside is, you know, pretty like this kitty. <laughs> but, you know, even if it's ugly, and fearsome, at least we'll know what we're dealing with. Yeah, <laughs> so. yeah and I guess if you're going to make a really, really big decision, um, being able to sort of audit the way that you got there is, is going to be important. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, I think that'll be increasingly important when we rely on uh, machines to make you know, important decisions, um, mm -hmm. not just uh, yeah. labeling our you know, images and our photo libraries. But even there, I mean, some of the mistakes could yeah. be um, you know, potentially inflammatory to people. There's, there's, I mean, if the listeners uh, Google uh, or Bing. It's okay. It's okay. <laughs> or use their favorite to look out. <laughs> yeah, there's, there's, there's been cases where people's, you know, photos have really got inappropriate and, and yeah. hurtful yeah. labels. So even in seem the most innocuous applications, it would be good to know how these things are working. But if we were doing um, image analysis in the medical environment, yeah. that would oh, be yes. super, super important. Yeah, and legally important to, yeah. to have these. Yeah, yeah. so. Um, so we're just trying to keep things simple and take some theory from social science, which you might not think of offhand as like being able to guide an analysis. Mm -hmm. So um, now I just maybe step back and um, go through some a, a little bit of science about how people explore. So the majority of work in labs involves what I'd call objective rewards. Um, so things like money or points. So people mm. try to make the right responses and they're rewarded for it. And it's no one has to tell you that. 20 pounds is better than 10 pounds. But when you move into the real world, mm -hmm. it's not so clear with subjective rewards. So who's going to say if this pizza is better than this one, right? It yeah. becomes more subjective. And so we want to look at how people explore in those circumstances. So you know, here's like a really brief definition of exploration. Um, so it's you know, seeking a goal under uncertainty, and there's trade-offs. So basically, you could exploit known opportunities, you know, like always go to your favorite restaurant. But if you don't explore, you'll never find something better. But every time you explore, you're foregoing um, the opportunity to have you know, your favorite. So there's yeah. this tension between the two things. And this is something any intelligent system faces, whether it's you know, a robot, a person, or, or, or certainly animals. You know, so whoops. Yeah, I think we've lost the. Uh, just try and clip. Just try and touch that. Do you think it's going to work? Hmm. I just give it one. We've lost the video here. Oh, there we oh, go. There we go. Okay, so these, these fellas are going supermarket shopping. We're going to be looking at people going shopping in Tesco, but um, here uh, they're going uh, term, uh, shopping termites. for termites. Yeah, and so if the, if the ape finds a good uh, hole with lots of termites in it and sticks with it, that's exploiting. But of course, to find a better one, better location, uh, you need to explore, try something new, or maybe your current location becomes depleted. So there's always this tension between exploring and exploiting. And you know, maybe here's a more human example. Mm -hmm. So if you're commuting to work, and you have a, a choice of two routes. Um, you know, if you always stick with your preferred one, um, you'll, you'll never discover a better one, right? Mm -hmm. So there's this issue you need to explore uh, a, a, enough, but there's also a key issue you want to focus on here is when do you explore? Um, so just to give you an example, imagine um, you, yesterday you took an alternative route to the office and it was horrible. There were roadworks. It was very mm -hmm. slow. Uh, you wouldn't try that same, explore that same route the next day, right? Because mm -hmm. you have very low uncertainty. You know the route, the roadworks are not going to complete. It's probably still going to be an inferior route. But maybe in four months, it will have improved. And so you'll have higher uncertainty about it, and you'll explore. So um, basically, we look at models that describe how people should explore ideally. So these are simple 
-hmm. not simpler, but partially observable Markov decision process. It's a related to dynamic program. They basically figure out you know, when you should explore. And they're complicated, but what they basically say is that you should explore when you're uncertain, which makes yeah. sense. Like, why, why, why explore when you're pretty sure you, you have the best thing already? Um, and so we look at whether people do this in the lab mm -hmm. in a task where there's two options, like those two roads. And one could leapfrog over the other and improve. And so you, know, you want to stick with the best option to be rewarded the most. But, um, but you need to explore. You won't discover that the other option might have improved, like, the other, like one road might have improved over the other. And so uh, we want to look whether people show this pattern of exploration here that the ideal model does, where um, the longer you've been exploiting, yeah. So the more you've been sticking with your preferred option, the more kind of curious you should become about the other option as you're uncertain about it. So you want to see if people show this. And surprisingly, you know, psychologists um, in an experimental psychology department um, always show you examples where people do the stupid thing. Here's a case where people do the smart thing. They actually do mm -hmm. explore more the longer they've been exploiting. Um, but this is, again, with objective rewards. Like, what do people do in the real world? Can we predict when people want to explore, say, new products? When you, when you're willing to try something new. Um, and we're going to look in a supermarket uh, context using a big data um, analysis um, with Tesco. So this work was done uh, jointly between UCL Dunhumby, which is a data consumer data science company, um, and Tesco using um, their loyalty card data. So if you've ever shopped in Tesco, we've, you might have been in the study. <laughs> it's like, yes. Um, and, um, if people get curious uh, about what I talk, I want to hear more. There's a very brief paper in the inaugural issue of Nature, Human Behavior, and a podcast and some, some popular press. OK, so um, we pretty much have a handle on how people explore on these constrained tasks with objective rewards like money, uh, you know, points, almost like a game-like task that we could do in the lab. But what goes on in the real world when mm -hmm. things are more complex and they unfold over days and um, and when things are subjective, I mean, I think this is really the key. So um, for decisions people make, um, we have this idea that we're you know, kind of rational, but maybe this isn't true. You know? So like, we think of our choices following our, our preferences. Mm. So we choose what we prefer. But maybe it could be the other way around at times. Maybe what we choose, we just come to prefer. You know? So I say this because the, when we consume things, it's very subjective. So again, like what makes one you know, brand of food better than another. There's so many dimensions to the, the quality, the, the, the flavor, the, 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 whether it's healthy or not. And how we weight those is fairly subjective. But also, each of those factors themselves, like taste, is subjective itself. So it might very well be, you know, if someone drives a BMW, they become a BMW person. Or if mm -hmm. they use, hopefully, they use a Microsoft product, become a Microsoft person. We'd like but, to think so. <laughs> yeah, but there might be a, a bit of, like, yeah. a, of, of but just. But you find some people. Yeah never use a particular thing, or they'll always use a different thing, you know, and, and you almost get that bias. It, you could put a sticker on this machine, and, uh -huh. and some people are always going to buy it, and some people are always going to avoid it, whereas what we're hoping is that they'll at least try it out. Yeah, yeah, so what we're, what we're going to be um, doing an analysis of is, like, when are people willing to try it, try yeah. it out? And, um, but it could well be that uh, you see this exact opposite pattern of where what you choose, you actually come <laughs> To prefer, and this this sounds um, crazy, but um, there's this phenomena um, referred to as um, choice blindness, in which people are very unaware of choices they just made. Um, and if you reverse the choice, you present them with something they didn't actually choose, and say, "Oh, you chose this." Not only will they not be aware of it, but they'll go on to justify it. So I just <laughs> want to show a really brief video yeah. of this. This is, uh, let's see if we get this to play. We managed to get to do a lot of Okay, great. So this is this woman in black is an experimenter unknown to this person, and she's this woman in white is tasting these two jams. But notice these are double-ended containers. Yeah, so yeah. when she tastes it, it's being turned over. So each one of these containers contains both <laughs> varieties of jam. <laughs> and so now the woman in white, notice it goes upside down. Yeah. Um, is being asked which do you prefer, and she's saying, well, I have a very sophisticated palate, so I prefer, you know, the first option. Now she's going to go on to detail more why, but she's actually tasting the other one, the one that was in the blue container she tasted before, because these are double-sided containers, <laughs> completely unaware and going on and on about it. So it's only one more step from this <laughs> to whatever ends up in your basket in the yeah, supermarket yeah. you just come to like. So that implies a very different pattern of exploration. Mm. And then we could, we could test. These are things you really couldn't test in the lab. But you know, we could take a, 
a big data approach. This, this is what we're going to do. We're just going to look at people's shopping patterns. And um, if people treat products in the world like information, um, they should show this pattern where the longer they've been explore, exploiting, so shown in mm. blue, the more likely they should be to explore. So it's almost like they get curious about the alternatives. Mm. And this is what we see in the lab, and this is what you should do from like a machine learning perspective. Mm -hmm. You know, like if you were building a robot, you'd probably want to do this. But if instead people are doing this, we call coherency maximization, where your preferences come to follow your choices, uh, you should see this exact opposite sawtooth pattern, mm -hmm. where uh, the more you exploit, the more you choose your favorite, the more likely you are to keep doing it until you kind of pop out of this entrainment, and then all bets are off, and it like restarts restarts uh, this, this, this process. Mm -hmm. So um, importantly, we're, I'm not saying here that um, people just choose something and stick with it forever. It's just that we, you know, we're just trying to predict when, when, will, they, when will people switch. And yeah. so we want to contrast these two views uh, by looking at a few hundred thousand shoppers over five years in the UK. So here's, here's our big data over a variety of products. Okay, and um, so we get data like a sequence of, for individual sequence of pur purchases for some product class, like here's just detergent. And we just code it whether um, yep. they've repeated the previous purchase or not. And so we have, we could code, we just call repeats ex, ex, exploits and uh, no repeats explorers. You could have more sophisticated codings. It, there's so much data, it ends up, which yeah, is yeah. nice, it ends up not mattering too so much. It's yeah. really simple buckets, even though they're buying different things. Yeah, yeah. different choices, yeah. yeah. Yeah, exactly. So we're just basically looking at the patterns of, the, of explore and exploit. So here's just, a. Uh, um, a big overview of the, if you look at the first two and a half years of an individual's data versus the last two and a half years over these hundreds of thousands of people, interestingly, it's not like they just settle into what they, um, what they, what their preferred thing is. They're always exploring. So this is showing the rate of exploration, and it's fairly stable mm -hmm. over this five years. So the first two and a half years, they're exploring overall as as much as the last two and a half. But here's like you know the key thing, and we'll expand it out. Is that um, this is looking at whether um, the pro when do people explore? Do they mm -hmm. explore when they're uh, on these short streaks or on these um, long streaks? And it's exact opposite of what you see in the lab. So um, the more someone's been exploiting, sticking with their favorite, the less likely they are uh, to explore. So mm -hmm. rather than like what we see like you know in the lab mm -hmm. up top, we don't see that. We see more of this strange pattern where it looks like people's preferences are following their choices. So this is kind of interesting. This is exactly, you know, kind of mm. opposite of what you'd expect uh, people are treating products as information. Um, some really basic um, models to make sense of this, and I, I don't think this qualifies as an equation. No, no. <laughs> good, it's good. got no, no, no Greek in it. No Greek, yeah, great. <laughs> Even for the laden Dirichlet allocation later, there will be no uh, Greek. Um, yeah, so basically want to just see if, if people have this tendency, this is just a little simple logistic regression model, and the mm -hmm. question is, is the slope negative, which means people are doing this coherency maximization, meaning they're less likely to explore the more they've been exploiting, or are they doing kind of what we saw in the lab, this more upward trend where you get kind of curious about the products, mm -hmm. and so, you know, just, just fit this model to each individual's data, and here's just a plot of, um, all, all the people in uh, black there, and you mm -hmm. can see that most people have this negative slip. So most people are consistent um, with um, this coherency maximization, this sort of I idea you just fall in love with what you buy until yeah. you don't, and then you pop out of and explore. Uh, I'll get to what those gray bars in a second because it's kind of important for making sense of this uh, mm -hmm. sequential data, but basically it's a kind of uh, control analysis. But the key here is, and we'll, we'll get to it because I think there's a fairly general point for, for others working with sequential data that you would want to do it. Yeah. But let me just spell it out. Um, just a little, a couple other things about how this could affect behavior. Um, mm -hmm. uh, so you want to look at, you know, coupon use. Does it also kind of follow from can we, these ideas of expiration? And it does. So if someone's in a long exploitation streak on like the top bar there, and they're they're mm -hmm. in love with their their product there. They're, they're going to be slower to redeem a coupon. It's going to take them more days for some novel product. Uh, and you see the exact opposite pattern. If you give somebody a coupon for their favorite thing, the longer they've been exploiting mm -hmm. it, um, the more important, um, yeah. the more they'll, they'll prioritize it. Um, uh, being a good scientists, we did a quick follow-up study, because this is all using existing data. We actually um, ran our own study where we sent people coupons out and looked at the redemption rate, and you see the same 
interactions. So you could almost double the rate people redo, redeem these coupons. If, you send, if they're on a long exploitation streak and you send them um, a coupon for something you know, that's novel and green, you know, they're not much interested in it. Mm -hmm. Whereas you know, if they're on the exploitation streak, they're very interested in it. So, um, so you could you know, basically hopefully less, less junk mail. You, 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 you put some science into this. You looked at the historical data, which could have all yeah. sorts of noise in it, and you did a yeah. controlled experiment. Yeah, so this is like a really good, important point. So there are things, obviously, a lot of, like, if you're working on an application, and you, you obviously, a lot of people won't have this opportunity to no. collect new data, but fortunately, we had the opportunity to do the proper science here, where we made sense of the old data, and then tried to go through and, and get a new sample to see, make sure these ideas held. What we also did, which um, you know, maybe some of the listers can do that don't have the opportunity to collect new data, is we use just basic cross-validation approaches too with the old yeah. data. So you know, we'd fit the model to a subset of the data, say the first four years of an mm -hmm. individual's purchase patterns, and then just see what happens without changing any of the parameters for that um, final year. And so that, that works too, and that's really key because even if you're using model selection statistics or using a fairly simple model, you could still fool yourself. So it's important to do what machine learning people call this out of sample uh, yeah. predictions. This is something you know, anybody could do. So if you have your application and you're, you're fitting some kind of, you know, even just regression model like here, a more complex machine learning model, you want to do this kind of you know, out of sample yeah. prediction just to, as a sanity check. You know? And it's so not too hard to do. It's going to take a, a, different, a different set to do our um, testing and scoring. Yeah. Again and again. And some of the tools, you can fold the data over. So you, oh, can, yeah. so you take your 20% testing set and you and then you've got 80% for, for training. Yeah. You then run it again, but use a different round oh, yeah. of 20%. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So you could have what uh, people refer to as multiple folds. Yeah. So, because I guess maybe this is um, getting um, too mathematical, but if you just yeah. split the data in half and train on half, test in half, in essence, you're throwing away half the data because mm. you're, you're going to bias towards simpler models because more complex models like more data. You know, mm -hmm. so like at the beginning of this talk, I, speaking about these, these vision models, these deep convolutional neural networks, they need a ton of data, so you wouldn't want to just throw away half the training data. So you could do exactly what you were saying. You could train on you know, 80% and then do a validation and test on the remaining, and then just swap them all around, you know, the different yeah. folds, um, so you and could and have and the best and of and both worlds. make sure worlds. the scores are going really high, and we're not uh, overfitting, I think, is the yeah. technical... Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, we've got a, yeah. a little um, figure on that later. But yeah, yeah cool. so over, yeah, overfitting is this um, phenomenon where you you have a more complex model, it'll always do better in the data you could see, but it, it, there comes a point where it'll start doing worse on the data you can't <laughs> see, you know? It's sort of like, a, maybe like, a, I don't know, what would it be? I don't want to say like a fortune teller, but somebody yeah. you know, could tell a really good story, but, we could you know. What Rain, yeah. Rooney had for breakfast over the last five weeks yeah. and, and make a prediction about how his team will perform on the weekend. Right, and right, then, exactly, some yeah. spurious correlation. Yeah. yeah, and maybe it works once, but yeah. So in this part of the talk, um, you know, we really used the, this lens on the big data. It's something very simple, but something the retailer never really got onto. You know, it was just really looking at how humans explore and ways in which they might not do it exactly how you thought. And uh, we were able to just uh, discern between these two views. And it, people you know, the, did this more, what we call coherency maximizing. They, they tried to make their choices and preferences align. And so it seems a bit irrational, but um, it's what people do. So the more they've been exploiting an option, the, the less likely they are to explore. But once they explore, they reset, OK? Um, and in terms of prediction, um, we, I didn't go into this, but um, it's almost like a personality trait how people explore things. So if somebody shows this pattern of exploration for, say, beer, they'll also show it for detergent. You know, like they show it across product classes. So they're, uh, if they do, you know, there are some people that do explore the opposite way with uncertainty mm -hmm. minimization. And those people, again, they'll do it across everything. So it's just, it's almost like you could predict from one product how people will explore mm -hmm. in another one, which is kind of interesting. Um, uh, yeah, so I guess if there's, you want to use this for good or for evil, you probably can. Uh, so if you want to change someone's behavior, uh, maybe, maybe one, or your own behavior, I mean, one suggestion would be uh, to hit people at a period of exploration. Uh, so what we've seen here is people become less and less open to offers, to coupons, mm -hmm. they're changing what they do, the more they're on an exploitation streak. Yeah. But once they try anything new, it then sort of all bets are off, then it's very like, they're very susceptible um, to being, you know, with the, with the their choice being influenced. So you, you can imagine this also as your New Year's resolution goes off the rails or yeah, something, yeah. be careful. <laughs> 
Um, but what you're saying is if I change my choice of red wine that I buy, I might at the same time be also influencing my choice of pizza. Because I'm, I'm going to try experimentation generally. Yeah, well, you know, so that's, that's a really fascinating idea. So we're trying to get actually a handle on that and the mm. data now. So we don't actually know. That's, oh, right. Okay. Yeah, so you're, um, yeah, this is, this is that's re really, really stupid. What we did find is that um, if for one product, so, so you're, you're basically saying, you know, things might be time locked so that mm. you go through these general periods mm. of exploration in your life. And we're looking to that now. But what we do have the data on is just for the individual products, if you show this pattern of the more you buy this thing, the more mm. you're gonna stick with it until you don't, you know, basically until you pop out of this sort of mm. downward slope. If you show that for, say, beer, you'll show that same pattern for uh, your detergent purchases, okay. you know. So yeah. whether they're time linked or not, yeah, don't know. They might, might be, might not be, because all these products, some things you can buy every day, some things you yeah. buy once a month, so sure. who knows, yeah. Um, so one thing that came up in this that um, might be a quick, quick uh, methods point that could apply more generally, not just to any kind of sequential data, uh, time series type analysis that uh, people might be doing is um, there, there's some odd things going on with sequential data, and we actually at, at times we've got results that uh, perplex us until we got a handle on it. So yep. um, I, I don't know, just to make an analogy about another kind of sequential data is if, if, if people are familiar with this idea of a hot hand when an athlete is performing at a high level, you know, they like feed them the ball, they're, they're golden right now, they, 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 they can do no wrong. Yep. Um, so athletes definitely believe this. It's even, uh, I found this old video game that, uh, let's see if I can get this to play. Uh, so here, the, this game, when a player makes a bunch of shots in a row, they, uh, their hand is so hot, it literally sets the ball on fire. <laughs> so uh, so I mean, clearly, there's a, clearly the hot hand must be true, right? It's in video games. But uh, those, those annoying psychologists, um, uh, decades ago pointed out that if you look, do the statistical analysis, and this is where the being careful about sequential data comes mm. in, the probability of making a shot in a professional basketball game following um, a success or a failure, a miss, is the same. So you'd think that doesn't mean yeah. there's a hot hand, but, uh, uh, but beware in sequential data. A, some economists have more recently suggested that's not the proper way to analyze sequential data. And this is something actually came up in ours. So I just want to share it uh, very briefly. Yeah with uh, listeners. So let's even make it simpler than just making basketball shots. Yep. Something you can't, can't bring in any sort of background knowledge, you know, all the defense is changing for the basketball pl the players or yep. whatnot. A coin, heads or tails, it's 50% it's chance of each, right? So what about if we make it a little bit more of a sequential question? What's the probability of a head uh, given a head on the previous flip? Now. Everyone will say, well, it's 50%. The coin doesn't have a memory. Mm -hmm. um, this is just basic probability. Why, why is this uh, professor asking me such ridiculous questions? Um, well, it turns out it's actually a bit more complicated than that. And this ends up coming out in sequential data analyses. So yes, if you only flip the coin once or an infinite times, it is 50%. But let's imagine we just look at a sequence like you might have in real data of mm -hmm. just uh, three flips. So with three flips, there's eight different possibilities. Yep. You can have all tails, all heads. And if we wanted this question of the probability of a head falling ahead, then these are sort of the interesting points that I've underlined there. Yep. Uh, obviously, if you have a head on the last yep. flip, you can't have a head on the next one. So if you go through the key events um, where you can measure this, and you just look at the probability of success or failure. So in the third row, there's tails, heads, tails. Mm -hmm. And so that's a failure. There's, and so the probability of success if you have that event is zero. On the last uh, trial, there's two events. Yep and they're both successes. Um, and if you go across the six events that are all equally likely, and you just plot this, um, so some events have zero chance of success, of a head falling ahead, some have half, some have one. They're all equally likely, you just do the math. Uh, it turns out with a limited sequence of three, the probability of a head falling ahead is not 50%, it's actually less, it's 5 twelfths. So th that means in these original hot hand studies, if the probability of making a basket following a successful mm -hmm. one is equal to failing, well, maybe they actually have a hot hand. So it's like there's all these biases in sequential analyses. And I'm sure some people are saying this isn't true. If you have time, you could go through this simple example in the mass. Or you know, if you really don't trust it, just get a coin and start flipping it three <laughs> times or thousands of times. But trust me, it's actually five twelves. You know? right. Yeah, I'm and, sure, I'm sure you I mean, I, I, I kind of get this prior probability it, thing. When you start studying probability, I think the first thing you realize is that 
what you thought was true. Yeah. It wasn't quite as true as you thought it was. Yeah, I mean, yeah. what's going on here, just maybe intuitively, is that mm. there's events, these six events that are relevant for calculating this probability are concentrated in a couple items, and that's sort of creating this mm. downward bias. And it happens in any time you have a limited uh, sample of data, which we always do, we deal with data. So mm. we could see this um, in our own data. So this is why I just want to make a little pitch. If you're mm. dealing with data to don't trust yourself, do like some kind of uh, what I call a permutation analysis. So mm -hmm. um, in this, so here are the model fits for the explore exploit stuff. In black was the analysis of mm -hmm. the real data. In gray, what we did is we shuffled the order of people's purchases yeah. randomly and then refit the model. And so you can see here, you'd think it would be centered at zero slope, right? If it was mm -hmm. just random, but there's actually the same skew you'd expect from what I just showed you with the coin flips towards uh, these uh, positive slopes. And so the key thing for us, so we actually underestimated our effects um, by, if we just, by just the, the black bars, if you can, because there's actually the whole distribution, there's a bias to shift everything upward, you know. So um, we had, this actually led to some spurious results early on before we realized this. So, I mean, the safe way to do things is to kind of do what we did is do, not do the standard, if you're going to do statistics, even with big data, sometimes mm. you need to. Um, not to use, you know, what people call a parametric distribution. So maybe if people have done any basic stats, you might hear like normal distribution. Mm -hmm. And there you, you, you focus on, it basically predicts the distribution of events. And, you know, so the higher the, the vertical axis there, the more likely the event. And what you do is you look if something's aberrant, you know, so here if it's maybe in the top 5%, mm -hmm. and you say, oh, that we've got something interesting here. Um, but that relies on assumptions. And as we just saw, like sometimes our assumptions aren't exactly right. So instead you could do, more of these permutation approaches where you build up mm. a distribution by shuffling your data and um, basically using your data to form your own distribution. Um, so obviously this is something, you know, there's probably tons of videos online that would spend an hour doing this. So I'm just gonna give a really brief flavor in case anyone uh, wants to chase up on it. But so, you know, for our purposes in this Explore Exploit, we had the original data and we analyzed it. We could also permute it. So here I'm just showing the same yep. data from a shopper but it's in a different order, you know? Mm -hmm. And so then we could analyze that the same way as the actual data. Uh, we could do this thousands of times and just like uh, plot it out. And then we could, so we could get a distribution, what we call what would happen according to chance. And then we could see where in that distribution does our actual result fall. And it turns out it's very extreme. So, I mean, it, I guess there the, the lesson would be, you know, be very careful. <laughs> You know, with sequential data, um, any kind of analysis you do is going to involve assumptions. And so one way to get around those is do a uh, permutation test where it's, it's almost like what statistics should have been. It's just that we didn't have fast computers in the past. And we didn't have the ability to and do that, these things. And, and now 5% was a yeah. classic example of that. He yeah. just produced a set of tables. And I'm forgetting who he was. And yeah. you'll help correct me here, Brad. Yeah. Um, but you, you just had that, he computed this curve because we can't plot that normal yeah. distribution mathematically. We run yeah. numbers and then you have to kind of work these how many standard deviations give you the 5% and... Yeah, exactly. And, and should it have been 2% or 1%? And yeah. yeah, I mean, luckily with these big data things, sometimes yeah. it's point oh. <laughs> yeah, but, yeah. Uh, but yeah, but sometimes not, right? So if you have to do some kind of intervention like the coupon study, we only sent it to 5,000 people, mm. so we're still in the realm of mm. using statistics. But yeah, you're absolutely right. So before we used to have tables, but even, even if you knew the exact probabilities, mm -hmm. you could compute them. You're still making so many assumptions about like how your data is structured when you use like what we call like parametric mm -hmm. statistics, and um, it's almost like more like statistics for like more, you know, hackers or computer science people. Like, there's no reason you don't have to learn these distributions. You could just make them yourself. Yeah. You know, using your your data, and usually they tend to be more robust. You know, so there is actually you don't get these catastrophic mistakes. So like. Uh, I do some work in brain imaging and try to relate this uh, to modeling. And there's this big um, scandal in that area recently where one of the most popular stats packages for analyzing these data sets, mm. and they're quite large, you know, they're like 100 gigabytes um, of images. And um, I mean, I, um, it was inflating uh, the results. It was because it had an inappropriate assumption in it. And, you know, the, the solution there was just, again, just do a permutation test, use your data as its own distribution. So this is a general lesson, and then maybe extra note of caution um, when you're working with sequential data, because a lot of your intuitions yeah. about sequences don't actually correspond um, to reality. And yeah. so what you're doing here is you've, you've just taken um, 
just shuffle the deck, essentially. Yeah, 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 basically, yeah. So instead of them all being in time order, each of those data points. Yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah. So, and, um, so for the few hundred thousand people in black is the actual data, and then for each person what we did is we just shuffled, so, so week one would be you know, week 10, and week two mm -hmm. would be week four, they just all shuffled into random permutation, random order, but then we just treated that data, that shuffled data, as if it were real data and analyzed it with the models. And so that's what's being plotted in gray there. Yeah. And so, I mean, the key thing here visually is just these two distributions are different. Mm. If these distributions were really overlapping in the same, well, you'd be like, well, there's nothing really in yeah. my data. It's just some um, artifact of s sequences of just how the data are structured. Yeah. I can't actually predict much. So. Here's one way to deal with, you know, am I actually picking up on something real in the data? We talked about another way earlier in terms of cross-validation. Mm -hmm. I mean, when you can do all these things, and of course, if you could collect an, your own sample of data to test it even better, but that's costly and something, you know, if uh, someone's coming to you with an application, you're not going to mm. always have that option. And it's yeah. likely going to be a very small sample, and then we're back into the fact that's going to be not a normal distribution Yeah, exactly. Again. Yeah, yeah. So this is something that um, people could do, and it's... Yeah, I mean, it's going to take some learning, probably going through some tutorial, but it doesn't require like, you know, as much background because you, you're basically just computing it on the fly. You're doing it yourself. Um, yeah, so in some ways, you'll need like less background knowledge to do this mm -hmm. too. Um, maybe just uh, very briefly uh, touch on another topic, uh, sort of more of a creative use of um, so maybe some of the listeners do work in um, uh, there's. In, in search or you know relating search terms mm. to one another. Uh, so there's all this this interest in that. And like here, I want to talk really briefly about adapting some of those uh, techniques uh, to people's uh, retail purchase patterns. So you right. can imagine that you're using, doing this in online cr commerce. So you know what makes a cat like a dog? So cat and dogs, uh, we interact with them in similar ways. Right? You pet a cat, mm. you pet mm. a dog, you feed your dog, you feed your cat. You don't do these things with a moped. So <laughs> it's. So it's, it's, it's yeah. one rationale, because yeah. cats and dogs appear in similar contexts. Uh, that makes them more similar. Uh, of course, cats and dogs are not exactly the same thing. So you take dogs for a walk. I mean, these sort of slightly mm. different contexts they appear in could ex help explain like, why people see them as different. Mm. There's some theories of, of meaning that work that way. Of course, you know there are exceptions. It's all probabilistic. So <laughs> you can take a cat for a walk, apparently. I saw one yeah. and taught them the other day. It, it cat shocked me. Class, yeah. yeah, exactly. <laughs> Uh, lots of luck. <laughs> uh, so this idea was actually formalized by a psychologist and computer scientist in terms of called latent semantic analysis. So basically, it was devised for words. Uh, so imagine you had um, a bunch of articles, like every article, I think they used the Wall Street Journal newspaper yep. early on, and you have these terms um, like money or um, uh, employee, uh, mm. Uh, whatever you have, so that would be uh, going on the rows, and then you'd have different articles. So those would be the mm. context, the documents, yep. and uh, you just tally up how many times does this word appear in this document and this yep. other document. And so if two terms were similar, two concepts were similar, you'd expect the, the rows to you know, correlate with each other, the counts to be similar. And to make it work a little bit better, you use this um, uh, low rank matrix um, yep. approximation technique called an SVD, but it just basically helps it generalize a little bit better. Uh, and the, late, the newer version of this, uh, there's no time to really get into the details, yeah. is uh, weight and Dirichlet allocation. It's a similar idea, um, but it's in a Bayesian terms. And there's all kinds of packages people could use to do this. Uh, but it says documents are generated by a mix of, of themes or topics. So imagine you had an article about a football player that was injured. So then you'd probably have themes of sport and medicine, you know, yeah, yeah. in there. Maybe even finances, right? If it's like, oh, we're going to bomb mm -hmm. out of the Champions League now, and what's going to happen yeah. in the transfer window? Uh, so you could model these um, documents as a combination of these things, and it works fairly well. And so here, just really briefly, we're going to do a trick. We're going to use the same technique that's used, but instead of having words, we're going to have products in a supermarket, mm -hmm. and instead of having uh, documents as the context will have baskets. So yep. what did a person buy? And so we could analyze millions of baskets. So this, I think, actually did require some, uh, some technology behind the scenes to just sure. chomp through this. And um, just some preliminary results. So you get, you, this actually works. So you, yeah. you pull out similarity spaces for, for products. So you get general topics like ready-made meals emerging, mm -hmm. you know, things that you would 
when you want to pretend you're cooking but aren't really cooking, <laughs> uh, low cost shop. But you also get very interesting specific topics that are incredibly yeah. specific. So you have a topic of just everything you would buy to make a stir fry. Yeah. Uh, or a really interesting one, it only occurs in late November uh, to January 1st or yes, so, exactly. which is Christmas by, you know, like, you know, uh, would roast you, and stuff. Yeah. In your stir fry example there, would you have, you know, maybe like a recipe book sort of that yeah. you'd want to mine for the same analysis potentially? Uh, so we, or would you infer the recipe book from there? Yeah, so what's really neat about this is the, the model, just like the techniques this has been applied mm -hmm. to in computational linguistics, um, doesn't know anything about this. So like you're... So it just has these product codes, and mm. it doesn't even know that like a yeah. small Coke is the similar to a larger Coke, you know. And it's oh, it's course. pulling out these 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 themes. But yes, yeah, so you could yeah. So um, these they're just emerging from the data. So this is kind of neat because this is something that's been done in uh, with words with computational yeah. linguistics. But you could imagine that this for all kinds of things. You could imagine even applying it. We talked before about social networks. Yeah. You imagine applying it to people in their interactions and mm. figuring out. You know, what kinds of people are they, or, or well, what, I mean, they, what departments yeah, are yeah, they? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so I mean, obviously, traditionally, we think this text analysis is doing things like um, aggre uh, aggregating news feeds uh -huh. and, um, you know, in your academic world, making sure that I haven't copied the homework from Johnny around yeah. the corner there yeah. uh, because I don't know what I'm doing. And because the two articles are really, really similar in the same terms yeah. are appearing in the same sort of frequencies. Yeah. But this is what fascinates me about data science. You can take a technique, a well-established mm -hmm. technique over here for text analysis, yeah. and suddenly we're applying it to a completely different area of human behavior. Yeah, no, it, it's, it's, it's really exciting. Yeah, this didn't have to work, but yeah, I guess that's what the stress. I mean, I'm sure a lot of the listeners could think of applications where they could, um, you know, if they want to read up on mm. these techniques, use them for things we would never even think of, you know? So it's, it's basically anything where you have parts, like words or products mm. that organize into some larger context or peer mobile context, like different newspaper articles or different shoppers' baskets. And um, yeah, I guess the, the, the miracle of you know, having a decent model and tons of data, uh, we could make this work. Um, so, oh, it's funny, we talked about overfitting before. Yeah, oh yeah, sorry, yeah. Yeah, so really just quick um, note on this. So we used a popular uh, commercial machine learning package to do this at first. And I'm not going to like call out names, mm. but it completely did not work right. So, um, so this is showing exactly what Andrew, what you're talking about before. Mm. That as the model gets more complex, uh, so that's showing model flexibility there on yeah. the horizontal axis. It'll fit the data better uh, that you can see, but it'll overfit and it'll generalize poorly uh, to new data that hasn't seen so out of sample. Yeah. And that's really what we care about, right? We don't mm. want to understand what we have. We want to understand the future or things we haven't seen yet. Um, so with the topics models. The complexity corresponds to just you know, how many topics are there. It's basically how many parameters are there to estimate in this model. And so um, as we increase the number of topics, we just saw weird things that happen in this package. This is just sort of having a general idea of how these models work, even if you're not expert in them. So the goodness of fit should go up, right? Mm. And eventually generalization should go down as you add more and more topics to overfit. That didn't happen here. There's other things, general things we picked up on this model too, um, that uh, as it it's learning and it's going through the training mm. set and it iterates through. It does something called uh, expectation maximization, but the details of it don't matter. But what matters is that it has to get better every iteration, mm. and it, it wasn't. It's just sort of, it's sort of like something was wrong, so we switched to a different package, and then of course it worked fine and with the results I showed. But I guess the point here is even if you're, you can't, everyone can't be a machine learning researcher, but you should just mm. pick up on a couple basic properties or checks or characteristics, you know, warning signs that the model isn't doing right and, and do those checks because otherwise you could use a respected package and for whatever reason, you know, there's some, some demons lurking in there, you'll end up um, getting results that, you know, you look at it, it'll look fine, but it's, you know, it, it's, it's, it's not. So if you just do a, a few couple quick checks, you could, um, you could catch these things, yeah. So standing back from the theory of whether yeah. we're going to do um, text and analytics or whether we're going to do logistic regression, or yeah. whether we're going to do forecasting, is there a sort of a bluffer's guide to being a data scientist? Part of from coming to a Bradley Love lecture, that, that, that is. You know, yeah. In other words, this is the sorts of approaches and techniques that we should be doing, um, irrespective of what algorithm or the you know, approach to the problem, if you will. Yeah, no, it's a really good question. I mean, I need... I need to give it more thought, and when I have a good answer, I'll put it on um, my Twitter to share it with folks. Uh, there's got to be partial solutions to this, but I guess what amazes me is, the, is just how often it doesn't happen, yeah. even with yeah. experts. So, like, um, you know, it's something that really needs to be done 
uh, more, a little bit more care. I think this area is just moving so quickly that everyone's falling over themselves to get yeah. things done. And maybe you know we should just try to advocate here doing things a little bit more theory driven. Maybe working with simpler models, uh, having you know res results you can make yeah. sense of, and just some checks you could just kind of trust what you have and, and build off of it. And so I think there's all these amazing advances now, but. Yeah, it would would be good, and I'll I'll, I'll give it some thought and try mm. to uh, post Maybe some it's a useful links. Yeah. Title for a nut, your next book, because <laughs> um, I, th I think the need is out there. We we're seeing whether it's us in data science and so on. Mm -hmm. We need more rigor. Yeah, we need more science in our science. If you, if you sort of yeah, mean. yeah, and it's just not like because it's good for us or in some moral yeah. sense. I think it's what you actually need to make further progress in the future. Because right now everything is fairly wide open, but. You know, as these systems become more important to our lives and we demand more and more of them, I mean, I think that's just the way things are going to go. It's probably a way people can distinguish themselves, too, uh, by doing this, you know, higher, higher quality work. Yeah. So you can maybe, maybe hopefully maybe move up the value chain in your own area. Bradley, thank you very much for yeah, taking you, an hour out of your busy day. It's yeah. been really good talking to you. I hope I've certainly learned a lot from that, and I think our audience have done, too. That's we're going to shake, take, we're going to take a short break now, and we'll be back in 15 minutes to talk about careers and what we should do about that.